اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم Guidance. 
Allah guided them even more. They were in a, in a society that was misguided, so everything around them was calling towards misguidance. But because they themselves were committed, Allah saw their commitment, so Allah gave them a gift of making them even more guided, regardless of their surroundings, regardless of the temptations and the tendencies of their society. But now let's come back to talking about the youth in our time. We just, I wanted to make a brief mention of the young people in Surah al and we'll talk about a few lessons from there, inshallah, and just drop some of them. But I want to come back to 2010, soon to be 2011, and just the reality of Muslim youth in our society. The first thing I want to say is that Muslims in general, we like to think of things, in some, in some respects, we like to think of things as better than they really are. In some sense we're pessimists, but in other sense we're optimists. And sometimes we are delusional optimists. In other words, we, we hope to think things are okay, even if they're not okay. Right? So even if, for, just to give you an extreme example, you, you smell the smoke, you're coughing in the house, the fire alarm's gone off, and you're sitting on the side going, yeah, we're just cooking something extra. You don't want to face reality. <laughs> if there's smoke, you better go check if there's a fire. You have, to, you have to be cautious and aware of the reality around you. Now, I've spoken about this a few times before, but I don't mind repeating myself. There are three major tendencies in this society. If you want to understand the problem of young Muslims in this country, you have to understand these three, at least these three tendencies. Three things that are a part of American society and are quickly becoming a part of the global society. So you can't even run away from it and go somewhere else and you won't get it, it won't get you here. It's becoming global. What are those three things? The first of those three things is a proliferation of shamelessness. Shamelessness is becoming widespread. It's becoming common. In, you know, in Islam, the standards of shame are constant. They don't change. What was shameless a thousand years ago is still shameless. What was inappropriate then is still inappropriate now. It doesn't change by the year. It doesn't change by the society. Allah sends us standards that don't change. They're, they're set in stone, if you will. But I'm talking about the spread of shamelessness even up by the standards of non-Muslims. A hundred years ago, America was a lot more shameless than it is now. Fifty years ago, it was a lot more shameless, shameful rather, than it is now. Twenty-five years ago, there was a lot more modesty in this society than there is now. Over the years, with the advent of technology and mass communication, what has also been mass communicated is shamelessness. What comes with it is shamelessness. And so, Using filthy language, seeing filth on a screen, seeing filth outside, seeing filth at school, seeing filth at college, at the workplace, on a billboard, on your on your handheld you know devices with, with internet connections, right? Seeing you know seeing things on your laptop or your TV, etc., etc. That has become very common. Shamelessness has become just commonplace. Now the thing is, the reason I want to mention that is when something happens all the time, you know what happens to you? You get used to it. When you see something all the time, you just, it doesn't shock you. I didn't, I don't come to this masjid every day. So when I came here after all these, this time, and I saw a new construction for a moment, I was like, wow, this is amazing. But you people who come here every day, you don't say that. You don't every day pepper and say, wow, that's pretty sweet. You don't do that, you get used to it. You get adjusted. So what I'm trying to say is, in our society, we have to some extent become accustomed to shamelessness. This was something that was never the case with the Muslims. The Muslim at the very, even getting close to language that is shameless. You know, Allah doesn't even talk about, you know, lowering your gaze, keeping your eyes low, keeping your modesty, the way you dress, the way you speak. That's talked about in the Quran, but Allah goes a step further in places like Sosul Qujarat. You know, with, with a shameless society comes shameless language, bad language, filthy language, cussing and foul language, things like that, swearing. Allah says, says fusuk iman. Even mention of filthy words. Even the filthy, the noun, the, the, the noun that is filthy, the, the word that is filthy, in and of itself, that is terrible once you have iman. This is how sensitive the society of faith is supposed to be. And by the way, when you get accustomed to corruption, when you see corruption and it doesn't bother you over here, then what does it mean? That the hearts have become hard. That means that the hearts are no longer soft. And when the hearts are not soft, what has become definitely weak? Iman has. Taqwa has. The fear of Allah is here. The faith in Allah is here. So if the fear of Allah is gone, then you won't have a problem looking at something. And not looking the other way, because there's no longer any fear of Allah. The more you look at it, the more shameless you become, the harder your heart gets. That's one tendency in this society, the wide spreading of shamelessness. The second tendency in this society is extreme individualism. Extreme individualism. What I mean by that is, 
Look, you ever heard the expression looking out for number one? You don't care about anybody, anybody, anybody but yourself. You just worry about yourself. What am I gonna wear? What am I gonna dress like? What am I gonna think? What, what car is my dad gonna get me? What college am I gonna go to? Everything's about me, 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 me. And he, by Islamic standards, we're not talking about Islamic standards. Those are something else. In Islamic standards, your first concern is not yourself, your first concern is Allah. And then after that, it is the believers. It's starting with your family. You take care of your, you know, your deen with Allah, and then your family. So you're more selfless than you are selfish in our deen. And the best way to be selfish in Islam is to be selfless. The best way to help yourself is to serve Allah. That's the best service you're doing. That is the act of selfishness. But we're in a society where everything is about yourself. And so it happens because of that, that in extreme individualism, Young people don't care about, forget society or the neighborhood or the country or the world, they don't even care about their own family. They don't care about their brother or their sister. They don't care about their parents. They don't care about their extended family and keeping in contact. They don't care if they don't call the mother if they're out late. They don't care. It's not their problem. It's not what they want to do. And even when they argue with their parents, they say, you never let me do what I want. If that's not extreme individualism, I don't know what is. The, you're supposed to raise a child, and children are supposed to be raised in a family saying, I'm looking out for number one, my family. After in our deen for, Allah, for, for Allah's obedience, then my family, and then my community, then my society. So people are raised as concerned citizens, if you will, and that's a natural thing in Islam. You're supposed to be raised as a concerned citizen. But our society is such that Muslims are non-Muslims. We become extremely, extremely, extremely individualistic. Now those, I've given you two tendencies so far. One is a lot of shamelessness, and the other is individualism. Let me tell you that these two things are connected to each other. Let me tell you how before I get to the third, okay? These two things are connected to each other, how? When you don't have a strong connection with your family, not only do you not love them or care about them, you lose respect for them. You don't respect your family like you're supposed to. And that's very common among youth today. Young people don't respect their elders like they're supposed to. They talk back, they, you know, they snicker behind their back, no matter what they are given, they're like, you don't get me anything. They talk, it's commonplace in public schools across this country that young people will talk about their parents in a derogatory fashion to each other. That's common, it's not, a, it's not an exception. Yeah, my dad's just retarded, man, it's just that and the other. That's how they'll talk. And you don't, don't think that Muslim kids are an exception, they're going to the same school. They don't have some special blood running in their veins that they're immune from that kind of garbage. They get influenced by it too. But when you lose respect for your family, it's impossible for you to respect somebody else's family. Isn't that true? If you don't even respect your own family, how are you going to respect somebody else's family? So that girl that's walking down the hallway, the picture you see on the TV screen, you don't think first that's somebody's daughter, that's somebody's wife, that's somebody's sister. I don't care if she doesn't have respect for herself, I should have more respect for another human being. Because I wouldn't want somebody to look at my sister, my wife, my daughter, my mother in that way. The way I'm looking at her. I wouldn't want that. I have respect for my family and naturally it gives me respect for other people's families. But when your respect for your own family is gone, then the second argument is gone. Now we're living in times, and I don't like to mention specific examples because they're too depressing. But I've seen a lot of things in the Muslim community. Like the brother and the sister going to the prom together. Right? He's got his date, she's got her date. Muslim kids, and they're going to the prom together. And he's okay with that. He's basically lost his dhila. You know, the this, this sense of chivalry and dignity and honor that the Muslim man has to, to protect the honor of his sister. Yeah, I've got a date, and she's got a date, it's all good. We can save discount on the limo. <laughs> We'll ride right together, we'll save some money. SubhanAllah, where's the manhood gone? Where's the, where's the sense of shame gone for the woman? And so on the men's side, there's that. On the women's side, there's something else. Something like uh, uh, Shaykh Amin Hassan Islaki, rahimahullah, who wrote a tafsir al al Quran, he said something about the shame and the, 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 uh, the bashfulness of women, of believing women. He said, Allah put shame as a natural part of a woman's character. He put shame in her character. And the reason for that is, if she doesn't have shame, she cannot... She is the most important ingredient in a family, and if she doesn't have shame, she cannot be part of a family. Because it is her shame that makes her protect her children, protect the dignity of her husband, protect the, the, the nobility of the household. When her shame is gone, she can no longer fulfill that role, she can't be trusted. And if she can't be trusted, family is gone. If family is gone, society is gone. So the shame of a woman, the shame of a young girl even, is so important. 
But we, we, we drop our standards even in, in, in terms of that in American society, we'll come to Muslim society in a second. So I've given you two so far. Individu extreme individualism, extreme shamelessness. Here's the third thing. I'll put it in very simple words. I won't give you big words. Where does respect come from? For young people. Where does respect, credibility, where does it come from? I went to school, high school a long time ago. I'm extremely old. I went to school in 1875 and when I did go to high school, here's where your respect came from and I want to know from the younger guys here if it's changed at all. Respect a lot of times came from the brand of clothes you're wearing, the kind of things you say, who you hang out with. It came from, you know, the, the kind of, uh, you know, clique you belong to, like, you know, there's the, there's the goth kids or the emo kids and there's the, the hip hop kids and you got the, you know, the, the, what are the skaters or whatever. I don't know what else, they got new categories nowadays, I'm not keeping up, so. There's the devil worshippers, those guys are awesome, yeah, the devil worshippers. So you got all these different cliques, and depending on which clique you belong to and how high up in the hierarchy you are, and by the way, the more obnoxious you are, the more disrespectful to the teacher you are, the more you make a scene, the louder you are at the cafeteria, the more popular you are. In Islam, the more humble you are, the more quiet you are, the more, the, the, the more respectful you are, that's how much better you are. And in high school culture, the more you are the opposite of all of those things, that's how much more popular you are. And the more obsessed with yourself you are. Somebody looks you in the eye and you say, what you looking at, son? Right? The more arrogant you are. That no, nobody can even look at you in the eye. You know, you're like Fe'alun, being carded, basically. <laughs> right? The more you are like that, the more popular you are. In other words, more than anything else, your respect comes from how, how uh, shameless with your words and your behavior, and how self-absorbed you are. That's where your popularity comes from. And everybody wants to be like you if you're that way. Or you want to be like somebody else who's that way. The young people are always looking up to somebody else in school. They won't say it, but they look at that guy and say, man, I wish I had what this guy has. That guy's got it. I wish I, you know, they're jealous of that. They, they look, and girls have it. There's this girl who barely dresses, you know, in clothes, extremely shameless, flaunts herself, has no respect for herself as a human being. Might as well be a, you know, a display at a zoo. And she's walking, and the girls are like, wow, she's really popular. I want to be just like her. And that's going on in the If they don't say it from their tongues, you make them say the stuff from Allah in Sunday school, they're thinking that in school. They think I wish I could be like her. You know? So they aspire respect and dignity with these things. And then let me tell you something specific about boys and girls that's also important. In teenage years, boys and girls have very fragile self-esteem. What that means is, they, get, they, they become very aware that they are being insulted or they're worth nothing. Now what happens as a result is for men, for boys, they get angry very quickly. Anytime they think somebody's trying to challenge their, their pride, they lose it. They will lose it. They'll be playing basketball and somebody blocks your shot. That is it. This is like, forget you know, all this change or advancement in society. You're back 2,000 years ago and you pick up your sword and you're going to come after that guy because he blocked your shot. You're going to foul him hard too on the next play. Why? Because your pride was hurt. Your pride was hurt. That's what it is. So you, you, your, self, your sense of respect came from the fact that you can you know, drop a J in his face and if you couldn't then you're worth nothing. Right? From the girls, their sense of respect in this corrupt society, you know where it comes from? How much attention they can garner from boys. How many boys are staring at me? And if they're not staring at me, I'm worth nothing. So they will degrade themselves more and more and more in search of attention. And let me tell you what else happens. On, on things like Facebook and MySpace and you know, what, Twitter, whatever else, there are these girls with low self-esteem. They think of themselves as ugly, nobody looks, nobody cares about them, nobody thinks they're cute, nobody asks them to prom or whatever. And some pervert writes them, hey, you're, you're beautiful. She says, no, I'm ugly. No, no, you're really beautiful. I'm sure you're really beautiful to me too. And then she starts getting sucked into that because he just made her feel good. That's no, nothing else. And a lot of times this happens to be old predators that are like 45 years old and they're preying on girl, young girls that are 14, 15, 16 years old. And that is a reality in the Muslim community. I'm not even talking about the outside. So I, I haven't talked to the youth yet, I'm talking about them. And what I'm trying to tell you is their sense of respect comes from how much, I, I, those two things, shamelessness and, and individualism. That's where it comes from. And this is a problem. Now how do we counter these things? When we want to address the problem of the youth, how do we counter all three of these things? If our society is extremely shameless, 
then the only way to counter that is we have to raise a family that is extremely shameful. The only way to counter one extreme is with the other extreme. You can't be wishy-washy about it. You can't be compromising about it. And the way to do that, the easiest, the first step is the easiest. And you will think it's the hardest, but it is the easiest. We have to control the media intake of our, ourselves and our family. There's just one bad scene in there. It's okay, it's just PG-13. It's not that bad. It's just, yeah, yeah, there's one bad thing in there, and this happens and that happens, but you know, I can, I can lower my eyes. I'll take a second look, but I'll lower my eyes eventually. You know? In other words, you say it's not that big of a deal. It's okay, you can let things slide. We as parents have to become vigilant about what we are allowing our children to be exposed to. Especially at early ages. When they get older, whether you like it or not, they will see all of those things. Whether you like it or not, they'll be exposed. If they're going to go to college, if they're going to get a job, if they're going to go to high school, or even if they go to Islamic high school, I don't care. They will be exposed to those things because it's as common as oxygen. You can't ignore it. But in the early ages, you want to build their guard up. So when they get to later ages, they're able to fight it off and say, no, that's disgusting. I'm not going to be a part of it. It is possible to raise young boys and girls that go to public school in this country and still take pride in their Islam and walk, that, walk down the hallway with pride without looking and gawking at people. They, just, they can look down and walk down with pride anyway. They can do that. We have that ability to do that, to raise those kinds of children, but we have to make that into a mission. That has to be pretty much a campaign in the Muslim community. It's critical. That's the first thing. The second thing is we have to instill into our children at all times a respect for family. But respect for family never comes until there's love for family. And love for family never comes until you spend time with your children. How many of you are having dinner with your kids every day? How many of you are talking to your kids for 30 to 45 minutes every day? When was the last time you actually sat down and had a conversation? You don't. You don't have time. You're working. You come back home, you're exhausted, you don't want to deal with it. They come over, you look at them over, hey, yeah, look what I did, I don't want to watch it. I'm watching the news, go away, go play with your toys. Didn't I get you an iPad touch? Go play with that. Get lost. You know? And what happens is we ignore our children at the early ages. When they get older, it's no surprise they ignore us. It's no surprise. In this society, more than anything else for Muslim parents, you have to befriend your children, spend a lot of time with them. They should see you as the first line of their first and best friends. When something happens in school, they should feel no hesitation in telling you. They should not think, oh my dad's going to kill me if I tell him. No, my dad's the only one who's going to help me if I tell him. If your kids don't feel like that, you're failing. A lot of times our kids are scared to talk to us. They're terrified. So they don't talk to us. They don't, they don't talk to us, that still means they need to talk to someone. So they talk to their non-Muslim friends and get non-Muslim advice. Because we shut the door for them because we're too harsh. So we have to learn to be open in communication and loving. And that will build respect for our children in the long run. That's the second thing that I, I'm, I'm suggesting. Here's the third. You know what I said the third thing was? Where do they get respect from? From garnering attention, from arrogance, from ego, these things. If you raise your children right, you know what they will learn? Respect comes from nowhere, from nowhere, except from the words, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. When you accept this religion of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, وَلِلَّهِ الْعِزَّةُ وَلِرَسُولِهِ وَلِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ And only Allah owns nobility and dignity and honor and authority and so do His messengers and, and, and it belongs to Him and to the believers. Believers have this dignity and nobility that nobody else has. If you raise your children right, you know what's going to happen when, by the time they get to high school? Even if you send them to public high school, they will see all kinds of film and they will look at it and not say, I wish I could be like that. They'll look at it and say, I feel so sorry for these pathetic people. They have no idea what's ahead of them. They have no purpose in their life. Allah gave me such clarity about what my life is about. I already have direction in my life. And these people are so pointless. They're going to be they're losers now, they'll be even bigger losers 10 years from now, and 200 years from now when they're in their graves, they'll be amazing losers. I feel bad for them. I feel sorry for them. You'll start looking down at corruption instead of being jealous of it. You'll start feeling bad for people who are victims of it instead of wanting to be like them or being tempted by them. That's the kind of kids we want to raise. That see their Islam as something that makes them superior. Superior to everything else. They don't, they're not arrogant, but they understand what Allah has given them is better. وَمَا عِنَّ اللَّهِ خَيْرٌ What Allah has is better. <laughs> what Allah, if, they could see, if they could see the world like that, man, I tell you, the world would be at their feet. People will come to them and say, man, what is it? Now? What makes you take, bro? 
I don't get you. You're not like everybody else. This has actually happened to me before. And it happened to a lot of young people before too. You know, you're in an elevator, you keep your eyes closed, the woman comes to me, you didn't look at me once. Why did you, why did you do that? He's like, I don't need to. I'm married. And I fear God. He goes, what religion are you? I was like, I, I'm of the religion that respects women. And I didn't tell her. So she had to ask me like, what religion, what religion, what religion? What religion? Islam. I said, <laughs> we have, when we stand up for our religion, I tell you, people around this will notice. People around this will notice. And so I'm done talking about the you. And I'm going to talk to the you. Just to them. In this society, in America, these are my own observations, you do not have to agree with them. You don't. You really don't. But I'll share with you what I'm convinced of at this point. In this society, Muslims still are very alienated. We're not connected to the world around us. Most of the neighbors of this masjid don't know this masjid. Don't know this, this place. Most of them have no idea who we are. I know people that became Muslim that used to live next door to the masjid. I know a brother, uh, a Joshua from, from Florida, who lived, literally used to go study the Bible next door to the masjid. He was memorizing like studies in the Bible, advanced studies in Christianity. And he used to walk past the masjid to go to the church to study for 10 years. And one day he was going to his uh, church class during Friday prayer, and somebody thought he's Muslim, so they said, come on, Hubba started. So he just followed them, and he went in, and he took Shahada. And then he said, I've been here 10 years, I have no idea who you guys are. That's not my fault, that's your fault. I should have known. But well, the first point I'm trying to make to everybody here, as part of this discussion, talking to the youth, is the society doesn't know who we are. They don't know. But you know what? The only people that are actually knee deep into society and they're in it every single day, you know who they are? Are you? Are you? Are you? They're not cut off from society like we are. Are you? They're deep into society. They play basketball with this society. They have Facebook friends with this society. They spend weekends with this society. They hang out with this society. They have study groups with this society. They will get careers with this society. Go to college with this society. They have friends that are in part and parcel of this, this country and this society and this culture. The only real ambassadors to Islam we have are not speakers. Not people like me sitting at a, at a mic. These are not the real ambassadors of Islam. The real representatives of this religion are the hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of young Muslims in this country. They more than anything else represent Islam. They more than anything else are in a position to introduce Islam to people that you and I will never meet. They see people that we will never see. They have connections with people they will never have connections with. So you guys, you need to first of all understand your value in the religion. The young people here, they need to understand what you guys are worth to this cause. You are a critical component of the work of Islam. Allah has made you for a really, really high purpose. Now let me tell you something. Just give you an, a, 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 something with an example of appreciation of what I'm trying to say to you. Just assume for a moment that you bought a very, very, very expensive, high maintenance computer. The job of that computer is to, to run very high level, hundreds of thousands of dollars expensive architectural software or 3D software, things like that. You do very high level work with this computer. Okay? So it's not something cheap, it's something extremely expensive and it's used for, in very professional settings. So you have it. And what you do with it, with your entire couple of years, while you had that computer, all you did was play video games on it. All you did was watch YouTube on it. Is that a disservice to what you have? What Allah has given you, first of all this Islam, then your youth, then to put you in a society where everybody else is heading in a different direction, Allah has given you more valuable than everybody else around you. You're in, you have the most precious item that you're disposed. Now, if you throw it away, you have no appreciation for what you have. You are more answerable to Allah than anyone else. And again, I'm talking to you. In this country, in, in, in America, we consider even 20 year olds, 22 year olds, 25 year olds, ah, they're just kids. Not have some fun, they're just kids. In Islam, the moment you hit puberty, you should be treated like an adult. You should be given responsibilities like an adult. You should take responsibility like an adult. You shouldn't be behaving like a child anymore. You, know, you, should, be, you should expect to, to be treated like one and act like one yourself. You can't be a goofball. 
And you know, the only reason you're a goof off is because you're hanging out with all these other goof offs. So you need to find an older company that is more mature than you, automatically you'll start becoming more mature too. Because that, that's what our religion accepts from you. You can say, ah, oh, they're just kids, they're, you know, they're just hanging out, they're just doing their thing. They'll grow up eventually. You think you're going to give that excuse before Allah on Judgment Day? They'll grow up eventually? I was just chilling. I was just hanging out. Passing the time. When I was older, I was going to get serious. They're old enough already. You were old enough already. 18 year olds in, in the Muslim army were generals of the army. 18 year olds. Leading an army in which the soldiers include Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu anhu, Umar al-Khattab, and he's leading the army. How is that even possible? You know? This is because you understood that they are their adults. They're going to stand up. Now these young, this is the last thing I'm, gonna, I'm speaking to the youth, but this time inshallah ta'ala, through the Qur'an and I will conclude. And as I tell you something from the story of the people of the cave, don't just think it's a story. Think of it like your story. These are people, if you don't know the story already, these are young people that accepted Islam, and when they accepted Islam, the, the society of their time was not tolerant. They said, hey, come back to the religion of shirk, or you will be executed publicly. You'll all be executed. And their names and the dates of their execution were actually inscribed. And now they escaped that society and went into hiding in a cave. And then Allah put them to sleep for you know, 300 some years. And then they came back, that's, that's the whole story. But a few things I want to share with you about this story that Allah mentions in particular. Let's see. Allah Azza wa says, When the young band of people turned towards the cave, Then they said, Our master, Give us a, a mercy that comes especially from you. Show us a mercy that comes especially from you. We have taken a step that is special. Nobody around us was obeying Allah, and we still decided to obey Allah. We did something special. So we want from you a special mercy. And make facilitation for us. That ye in Arabic is to make ease, to make the door open, to, to open up the avenue, to make all the, the necessary arrangements. They're asking Allah, oh Allah, make all the arrangements that whatever decision we make, it is guided. In other words, these people turn to Allah for counseling. You ever heard of a youth counselor? When you need help, they go to a counselor? Who do these people need counsel get? Who do they get counsel from? Allah Himself, subhanahu wa ta'ala. They turn to him and they say, make us, you know, give us, open these doors for us, facilitate for us, make arrangements for us in our the decision that we decided to take. Then a couple of ayat later, Allah says, I mentioned this before, in Nahum Fitya, no doubt they were young people. They were young people. Because you know, when you read the ayat, you feel like these are very mature people. So Allah makes it important enough, not just to say they were young people, it is, there is no doubt they were young people, as though there might be doubt in the mind. You know, in inna, this adat al-tamkid is used, the izad al shaq to remove doubt. So when you read their story, you feel like these people are, these are really strong, mature individuals. Allah says, no doubt about it, they were young. But because most of the time when you think of young, you don't think mature. But Allah is making that point. Amanu bi rabbi. What gave them their maturity? They really had iman in their master. Was it na huda? And we increased them in terms of guidance. Then Allah explains, what does it mean to increase guidance? How does, it, how does it increase them in terms of guidance? وَرَضَطْنَا عَلَىٰ قُلُوبِهِمْ وَرَضَطْنَا عَلَىٰ قُلُوبِهِمْ We caused firmness. We gave, you know, toughness upon their hearts. Their hearts became strong and tied to Allah. In other words, they weren't just going through a phase where they got fired up and decided to take their religion seriously. That was me, sorry. To take their religion seriously, and then the next day they turned back and they gave in to their temptations again. They stuck it out. Is Bamu when they when they stood really means rose. You know, Our ma our Lord, our Master is the Master of the skies and the earth. We are never going to call on anyone to worship or obey other than Him. And the, here the word ilah is important. The word ilah has two meanings: the one you worship and the one you obey. Both. Al mubah al ma'mud ilah. Okay, the one who's obeyed and the one who is. Worship. Now think about the society. People can worship false gods, but at the same time, they obey their desires, they obey their temptations, they obey the tendencies of their crowd, or what their friends want them to do. They obey all of these things. Is that me or you? Or? That would be. Yeah, okay. So they are going to obey only Allah, and they won't even obey their own temptations. 
Allah says in Quran, وَأَرَأَيْتَ مَنِ اتَّخَذَ إِلَىٰ هَقُّ هَوَاهُ Did you see the one who takes his own self, his own pathetic desires, empty desires, and turns them into his own God, that he worships and obeys them? And we don't worship our desires, but we do obey them. That's the implication here. So they're able to fight their, their, their temptations and stick it through in their religion. Now, the last thing, they realize that the society around them is doing lots of crimes, but there is one crime above all the other crimes. And that is why they can no longer go with the flow. There's one thing they realize, and they've seen it, and because they've seen it, nothing about that society impresses them. They realize what Allah has given them is better. What is that one thing? Listen. This is our nation. These are our nation. They have taken gods besides Allah. And then he said, they say, How come they know? They don't bring any authoritative proof for the religion that they follow, for the way of life that they follow. Even the most, the biggest party animal you know, you ask him, you think you would just create a party? Well, what makes you think that? Allah gave you such an amazing mind, the amazing ability to speak. You're going to use that amazing ability to speak, to, use, to, to, to utter filthy words? Do you think you get away with that? Listen, man, I don't want to think about it. They never bring you any evidence or proof. How come they never, they just ask you not to think about it? Don't worry about it, man, chill out. That's the attitude, chill out, relax, don't, don't think about it. And these young people realize, no, how come they, they ask us to chill out? How come they don't want us to think about it? How come they don't bring any proof? Who can do more wrong than who makes up, the one who makes lies up against Allah? They realize this, the, the, the evils of the society, the root of them is people think that they are okay with Allah no matter what they do. They are lying against Allah. And their young people are not going to, these young people will not stand for it. SubhanAllah. You know what's, what's really peculiar and interesting to me about this story? is that the Messenger told us وسلم, that Surah Al-Kahf will protect us from the fitna that is coming later on in this Ummah, in the future. And this is the future. We don't know if that fitna that the Dajjal is here or not, but certainly the fitna in this society, Surah Al-Kahf certainly protects us from it. Certainly protects us. There are so many guidances in this Surah in regards to it. The young brothers here, just get yourself busy. There are so many great projects you can be a part of. The more free time you have, the more shaitan will get you. The more you are alone on your laptop, the more you will do evil. You will be addicted. And once you're addicted now, by the time you get married in 25, 26, you will have no respect for women. So you'll have terrible married lives. Because you lost your dignity when you were like 16, 17. How are you going to raise a family? How are you going to raise shameful daughters if you have no shame yourself? How are you going to do that? You're not. The sisters here, take your pictures off of Facebook. Have some respect for your family. Have some respect for them. Would you want, you know, uh, would you, and any husband want their wife pictures to be up there like that? A, a, a father would like his daughter's pictures to be like that? You know? Just because the non Muslims are doing it and doing it like, you know, without any consideration, don't think it's okay. It's not okay. That doesn't make it okay. We've just made certain, these things that were the, the part of our society, it started with lowering your eyes. And it protects us from so many bigger problems. When you stop lowering your eyes, all these other floodgates and all these other problems open up. And that's what's happening to young people. So now that I'm done talking to young people, I figure how much time do I have? Fifteen. Okay. Half so I can talk to, to the elders hour. here. Yeah. I'm happy you guys too. Actually half an hour. Half an hour. I'll, I'll make much less than that. I want to say something to the elders you, you might not like to hear. But I have to say. And this is very unpleasant for me to say. I'm not comfortable saying what I'm about to say. But this is something we don't talk about. And this is something that's happening. And we have to face it. We have to face it. In this society, I told you, one of the biggest problems is the, the proliferation of shamelessness. That's what I told you. And our young people are being raised in this society. First of all, Muslims generally close their eyes because you come from a society which was shameful. So you assume that your children come from a good family, therefore they must not be exposed to any of these things. And even if they are, they're not tempted by it because they come from a good family. They come from a good family, how could they have bad thoughts? This is ridiculous. That idea is absolutely absurd. And then you say, you know, in our minds what's happened is marriage is something that happens once you have your career, 
once you have, you know, you're, you're already a doctor, you're already, you know, you finished your MBA, and you've gotten a job for a couple of years, and you, you know, uh, you built yourself financially, now you're ready for marriage. Now, to get married, you have to go through college. To go through college, you have to be on campus. If you're going to be on campus, what are you going to see for eight years? The guys will tell you. Actually, they won't tell you. They're, they're ashamed to tell you. There, there is, uh, shamelessness doesn't even begin to cover what young Muslims, men and women, are exposed to in high school and in college. And you want them to be in that environment, eight This is a delusion. And you know what a lot of these kids do? They're scared of their parents. They're going to college. They don't want to talk to their parents about marriage. They don't want to talk about marriage. Because, you know, it's, it's, my parents are going to kill me, man. If I talk about marriage, they're kill me. I don't have my master's yet. I don't have my bachelor's yet. I don't have this yet. I don't have that yet. So I can't talk to them about it. Okay. I can't talk to them about it, but I still have all these crazy temptations. So you know what they do? They develop dual personalities at home. So they won't get married, but they do have a girlfriend on the side. They've done all kinds of things already. They're addicted to all kinds of filth on the internet. And this is not the exception, this is the norm. This is the, this is the average case. Our children are diseased. Their, their iman is being destroyed because of our stubbornness. We brought them into this society. They didn't come here, we brought them here. We brought them into a shameless society. And the solution to that shamelessness that Allah gave is nikah. And if you're not ready to get them married, then don't put them in that position. And if you put them in that position, you don't think Allah will ask you about it? You don't think Allah will come after you? You put them there. You, you put them in that, in that situation. And I'm not saying that young people should get, you know, the moment they have puberty, they should get married. That's not what I'm saying. Everything comes together. If we raise them in a mature way and we treat, respect them, and we expect them to treat themselves like adults, they will mature early, and when they mature early, they can marry early. If they're not maturing early, then it doesn't make sense marrying early, because marriage is a huge responsibility, starting a family. <laughs> But if we don't put these things together, then we are setting ourselves up for destruction, I tell you. I know of cases, these are real cases. Real cases, you know. I'm, a friend of mine is a youth counselor. These guys come in, 20, 22 year old, grown Muslim men. They're coming to him and crying. I'm ready to get married. This girl I like, we've been talking for two years, but I'm not going to tell my parents. She's Muslim too. We've been talking, we keep talking. We're not going to get married. We can't get married because my dad says I have to finish my school. I've got five more years. And they're crying. And you say, how could you do that? Astaghfirullah. Stop saying Astaghfirullah, except that that's the reality. That's happening. You would be shocked of what you will find on the text message history of the young people in the cell, with their cell phones here. Hmm? Yeah, I know. I'm not asking you to show. <laughs> but it's there. You'd be shocked to know what's on their Facebook profiles. You'd be shocked to know their browser histories and why they're so squeaky clean. Why they clean it out every time they leave the house. But you'd be shocked to know. We put them in that position. We've done that to them. Now if you do that to them now, and they're addicted to things like pornography, they're addicted to things like dating, and premarital relationships, and partying and clubbing. Muslim kids clubbing. Muslim kids, MSA presidents. I know them. Clubbing. You know? On the one hand, religious space, to make their parents proud. On the other hand, they gotta do what they gotta do. You know, they have urges, they can't help themselves. And then when these, these people, they have these addictions for 10 years, since they were teenagers until they got married, they have these addictions for 10 years. Do you think they have nikah and the next day their addictions are going to be gone? Is that how addiction works? No. If they were shamed, they lost their shame way before, they're not going to regain it. And you just ruined a girl's life too. You just ruined a girl's life. And what kind of children are you going to raise? All hell is written. We don't see this problem right now. We don't see it. This is happening behind closed doors. This is happening in the minds of our children. The massages are coming up and the family structure is going down. We have to watch out. That's me again. We have to watch out. We have to protect this before it's too late. There are, we've lost too many youth already. If we don't become proactive now, and the, I say the agenda of every masjid should be that. Building strong families. Nothing else is more important. Nothing else is more important. And this was not a talk about welcoming, welcoming young people into the Messiah. As important as it is to build an amazing structure, equally, if not more important, a sister's lounge, where they can hang out instead of Starbucks, with Wi-Fi and all of that stuff. A basketball court for the guys, equally important. So they learn to hang out here and spend time here. Because if they're here, then it's proof that they're not somewhere worse. And if they're not here, who knows where they are. 
Right? This, this is not even a talk about that. This is just about our priorities. My, I mean, I, subhanAllah, I, Allah has gifted me with three daughters and two sons. I have five children. It terrifies me. It really absolutely scares me to death. I was at a youth program, I'm not going to tell you which one. Five, six hundred young people, high school kids, Muslim kids, that's the other day. I was supposed to speak there. I got there maybe four or five hours early, so I'm just spending time with these five hundred teenagers. Wallahi, I was going to cry myself to death. Because I said, man, I, I still got ten years of my girls are going to be teens. What am I, what am I going to do? This is where, these are the religious kids. These aren't even the party kids. These are the good Muslim kids. What's happening here? And these, are having, these guys are having a Islamic program. We have to get our act together. Young people have to get their act together. And nobody, I'm blaming the elders as much as I am blaming the youth. I'm not passing the buck on any one of you. Because on Judgment Day, you're not going to be able to say, well, my must didn't have a basketball court and hence I was clubbing. <laughs> That's not going to work. It's not going to work. <laughs> And on the other hand, you know, parents are, you, you can't say, well, I paid this tuition and I, you know, we were raised in a good family, I should bring in the Jamal's in a while. I don't know what else I can do. That's not going to fly either. We both have to become, both the young and the old have to become proactive and open this discussion carefully and craft this discussion. And it needs to be a discussion in every Muslim community across this country. Because, wallahi, if you don't, I consider nothing else a bigger state of emergency in the Muslim world. Especially in the United States, nothing is a bigger state of emergency than the state of our families, the state of how we're raising our children, the state, the rate at which our young people are losing their shame, they're losing their kaya. And if you don't have kaya, you have, how can you have iman? Kaya is the, the essential ingredient in iman. It's an essential ingredient in faith. May Allah Azza wa Jalla give us the ability to protect our kaya, to revive our shame, to guard it, to raise children that are that are shameful and bashful. May Allah raise, you know, help us give the ability to make ourselves and our children the kind of people that aren't jealous of corruption, but they feel bad for it, and they, the only thing they find dignity and respect and honor is in is in, is in their kalima, is in their la ilaha illallah. But like too many people lost their blood, so one day we can say la ilaha illallah. Too many people. They lost their lives making dua to Allah. One day my children will say, La ilaha illallah. That's why they died. And we should respect their memory. And these are not thousands of years ago. This is 50 years ago, 70 years ago, 80 years ago, not even a century ago, where Muslims were dying. So, because they could get rid of colonizers in Algeria, in Pakistan, in Bangladesh, and, you know, in the Indian subcontinent, the Africans. They're fighting colonizers. So they could say, We can have masajid in this land. We can, our children can say, La ilaha illallah one day. We are those children. What are we doing to respect their legacy? Or are we spitting at it? That's what we have to think about. May Allah Azza wa Jalla make us a strong Ummah once again. May Allah Azza wa Jalla, you know, take the good of what was said and enter it into mine and your hearts. And anything that I said that is incorrect, it's my own fault. And I ask Allah's forgiveness and I ask all of you to forgive me as well. Barakallahu li barakum fi al-Qur'an al-Hakim. Barakallahu wa iyaakum bil ayati wa bikul hakim. Yeah. Yeah, one of my favorite like uh, models in the country. Uh, not, I, I won't mention them in theory. I'll mention them practically. One of my favorite models is what's happening in Richardson, Texas, in Dallas. Uh, there's Brother Abdul Rahman Murphy. He's the youth uh, director, and he started some really creative initiatives. They've got yoga classes for girls and a lounge and a counseling session. They've got you know basketball tournaments running now. They're doing kickboxing, all kinds of fun stuff. They did a barbecue, no lectures, no Islamic lectures, nothing. Just a barbecue or an online basketball tournament for the guys, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. What I'm trying to say is youth need to stay busy. We have to find ways of keeping them happily busy in the masjid. Or in a, in, in a good environment, in a good clean environment. If you can do that, you've already done a great service. Even if you're not teaching them religion right now, that's not the more important thing right now. The more important thing is, they should get a sense of affiliation with Muslims. Then when they feel that bond, they will want to learn on their own. Right now, if you try to shove lectures down their throat, they won't come. A lot of you guys have friends, they will never come to the lecture. They will never sit in a lecture. But if you say, man, we're playing ball tonight, there's a nice court there. Are they going to come? Sure. There's a barbecue. And they're going to play some video games. Are they going to come? Oh my God, don't show up like you won't believe. You know, he did that. He did that in Chicago when he was a youth director, right? So he said, okay, we're doing an all-nighter, and we're just, it's just you, whatever you want to talk about, and a basketball team and a barbecue. 500 kids showed up. 500 kids. 
Kids that have never been seen in the masjid before. Kids that don't even know how to say La ilaha illallah. They show up. That's amazing. Why? Because the doors to the masjid were open to them. They were given a welcoming you know, program. So that's part of our strategy. That's, that's one area that we have to address. The second thing is sisters usually get ignored in masjid. We have to have really creative, well-crafted, well-funded, uh, you know, social programs for girls. And I, I have a hard time figuring girls out because I'm not one and I just, they're complicated. Uh, so I can't figure out my daughters, I can't figure out my wife or my sister. Okay. But uh, here's one thing I figured out. When I used to be a, a Sunday school director, my community back in Bangladesh made the mistake of making me Sunday school director. So they, they, uh, the strategy for the guys, the teenage guys was, we'd get together at night, like Saturday night, We'll have a barbecue, we'll play basketball, we'll just hang out in the mushroom, just chill, goof off all night, pray pleasure, go hit the beach, go swim or whatever, then come back, go to eat Dunkin' Donuts, we all love Dunkin' Donuts, it's a thing in Long Island. And then we come back, and that, that was our Sunday school. That's maybe more an eye here and there, but that, that was it. That's the most amazing thing for, for the guys. Then you say to the girl, what do you want to do? I don't know. <laughs> I guess I want to talk. <laughs> the, the best time the girls had, you know what it was? We give them some money and say, just, just go to Starbucks and go talk to each other. And they sit there for an hour chit chatting and they're happy. They're so happy. That was amazing. Can we do that again next week? <laughs> they they smart talk. They want to hang out with each other. They want to socialize. It's a thing. We don't guys don't have it like girls do. So give them a place to socialize. A nice place. That should make Starbucks look bad. They got coffee there, they got a big screen TV there, they got like, you know, lectures running or whatever, they can talk to each other, they can do their homework or whatever. Give them a place to socialize. Young girls need a, you know, need to feel connected to a society. And especially in our times where there are all these virtual societies, these social networking groups, that are sucking our young girls away. And they're developing double lives. And they got screenings that you can't find because they're, they're afraid of exposing their identity. So they're becoming part of these, of these virtual worlds where you know all kinds of corruption is there. Why? They feel the need for that because human beings have a need to be part of a social gathering, a social network. Give them that. Why deny them that? Give them that. Give them that question. We can do these, these are very simple things. But if we implement them, man, I tell you, the, the face of the community change. The light of the face of the community change. You know the first week that he started in the youth direction? Girl walks in, Muslim girl, She's expecting. Parents don't know. Sixteen-year-old girl, not married. These are realities of the Muslim community. Who's going to deal with them? If not the Muslim, if not our community, then we can we can turn a blind eye to this stuff for Allah. That is the exception to the rule. That doesn't normally happen. Let me tell you, it happens more often than you think. It happens more often than you think, and it's becoming even more common because we're not addressing. It. We have to address. It, you know. The, uh, the other thing is, every masjid, in my opinion, should have a youth director. Every masjid. There should be no exception. Every masjid, even and I, I, I argue, more important than the job of the imam today is the job of the youth director. The imam may or may not be able to connect with the youth. May not be able to hang out with them late at night because he's got a family to take care of himself and he's got other responsibilities in the community. But the youth director's job is to just hang out with the guys. You know, and his wife's job is to hang out with the girls. And they're just there as their big brother, big sister kind of thing. They go hang out at the restaurant together, they play basketball together, they do, th they do trips together, etc., etc. But they build this affiliation. That has to happen. That's a critical, critical job description that is not being fulfilled for the most part, it, and it needs to. Which is why I say, I mean, it's one such project, there are other projects going on too, but this is one of my favorite ones. Uh, you know, serious leadership of the community should go take a trip to Richardson and see what the other is doing. Or maybe even invite him over and just get some ideas. You know? Because I think if it's, if it's not, if you, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. If it's being done, and being done successfully, why not be, you know, a duplicate instead of recreate, inshallah. I hope that addresses your question. Yeah? Like you said, shamelessness is right now all over. So is it even uh, practical to shield the youth? And plus we don't, at the same time we want them to be interacting with the real world and there it is shamelessness. So how far are we going to be able okay. to do this? I, my theory, I don't have the, the answers. I have theories. These are my own theories once again, these are not religious verdicts. My theory is until children are 11 or 12, they should be sheltered. At least 10, they should be sheltered. 
Uh, if you if you take their shame, if their shame becomes weak before then, then forget it. Now after that, they can, you can start having a mature conversation with them like adults, not like children. Hey, put your eyes down, don't look at that. No, no, no. A mature cognitive conversation with them. You know why that's shameless? You know what that creates? The conversation I'm having with you. People like that have more respect for themselves and have more respect for others. And you know, we wouldn't want our mothers, our, our sister, our cousin to look like that, would we? We would be disgusted by that. So we should be disgusted by that for all human beings. That's not something we look, we look up to. We can have those conversations with kids when, as though you are talking to an adult. And when you talk to them as like an adult, they, you'll be surprised how much kids understand. They do. They just have to be, their thought process has to be matured that way, right? So this is, it, it, you know, we call this cognitive psychology, right? Cognitive persuasion. In other words, you're discussing things with them, helping them understand the benefits of things, the harms of things. That's something we have. This conversation is more, more effective from the parents than from anybody else in early age. By the time they turn 12, 13, you know what happens? This is actually a psychological curve. Uh, when children are young, they get most of their influence from their parents. And the least influence from their friends. They mostly want to do what the, what the parents want. They want to draw a picture of mom and dad, they want to color with them, go tell them a story, etc., etc. Everything's about the parents. And the friends play a little role. But as children start getting older, this happens. So you have, you know, the, the friends are the most important and the parents barely play a role in how you dress or how you talk or how you think about things. Now, that's fine, but you have to play the role of friend now. If you do it, if you speak to them, then even when they are exposed, you'll see good results. You know? Just a follow-up one. For the smaller kids, like you said, even in the, like, is it prudent then to deny smaller kids also of uh, small things like movies and small yeah, cartoon movies? Because even there, there is so much... Sure. It's, so, it's absolutely they, appropriate they, to deny your children any knowledge of who Miley Cyrus is, yeah. or who Hannah Montana is, or who the Proud family is on Disney, or Disney altogether, or, or uh, you know, uh, you know, fairly odd parents, or, you know, Jimmy Neutron, it's totally okay. You, you know, I watch a lot so of cartoons. okay for them to like, feel behind? No, no, no. Let me tell you, I watch a lot of cartoons. You know why I watch a lot of cartoons? First of all, I enjoy them. And secondly, <laughs> secondly, because I watch them so that I know what my children are going to watch the next day. And my kids watch a lot of stuff that I used to watch when I was a kid, because back when I was a kid in the 1850s, cartoons were a lot cleaner. So my kids love Tom and Jerry. They love it. Cat and mouse trying to kill each other? What better entertainment is there? It's amazing. Right? So uh, you can have... Um, you know, uh, back in the day, Inspector Cat and all these kiddie cartoons that were actually for kids. They didn't put any sexual innuendo in there. They didn't throw in something from here and there. They don't, they don't spare anything nowadays. Everything has something filthy in it. Everything. Everything. There's no movie today that doesn't have some element of filth or, or vulgarity in it. You know? And even these 3D movies that come out a lot of times, right? Like the worst thing to do for your kids nowadays, Toy Story 3. Worst thing to do is Ken and Barbie hitting on each other the entire cartoon. And you're making that normal for your, for your six-year-old kid. For your six-year-old kid. That's disturbing, you know? They don't even spare cartoons anymore. Doesn't mean there's no such thing as good, clean entertainment. There is such a thing. Actually, there are even Christian groups that talk about clean movies and they make ratings because they're concerned parents too. They have similar values that we do in some cases. We should take advantage of those kinds of resources. Muslims should have been the first to do it, but they've already done it, so we should take advantage of what they have. Um, my kids watch cartoons, but we, we know what they watch. And we know what they're not allowed to watch. And if, they, if something inappropriate does come up, we have a discussion about it right away. You know, no family should make it a normal part of a child's upbringing to watch SpongeBob SquarePants. I mean, the, the, look at the character, and you tell me what's normal about that. <laughs> you know, what's normal about that? And, and, and you're, these kind of, and that's from a shamelessness point of view. The other thing is theological implications. Uh, Dragon Ball and well, Yu-Gi-Oh and yu gi -Oh, and whatever. Like all these like Japanese animation cartoons, all of them have mythologies. God of death, God of evil, God of good. The dragon brings you back to life and this and that. And our kids get so sucked into it, they start believing this stuff. They start believing it, you know. They have dreams about it. Those, every little car has a shape on picture on it. They have nightmares about those numbers. Six, it's funny on one side, but for a five-year-old, it's horrifying. It's horrifying that they start
start thinking like that. That they're driving, they're looking behind the corner. You know, you can terrify them by throwing a car at them, they'll run under the bed. You know, that's disturbing. It really is. You know, how are you going to teach a child proper iman when they're learning to fear these mythical creatures and they don't have any fear of Allah, they have no idea what that is. You know? These are things we have to be concerned with in our time. This is where you have to be so proactive, super proactive. We, I say we should even have groups dedicated to studying just this, to, to producing resources for Muslim families. That's what I say. People, especially sisters, they should do this kind of thing. They can help in, in a way of understanding. They're far more sensitive to some of these things. Inshallah. Yeah. Yes, Islamic countries do that. Yeah, Islamic countries do do that. I'm not going to name them, but uh, they are sometimes really lame. Like Islamic countries. Some of them are okay, but most of them are really lame. Like they're not active, like professional. Like I don't want to watch it. It's like, like the, 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 the guy says something first, then the character's going. You couldn't sink that better, dude. I could do that. You can't do that. So, so although, I mean, we should have really Muslims should be creative enough to have their own Sesame Street. They should have their own, you know, superhero cartoons and stuff. I don't know about cartoons. I guess we need to put up to that, but. We should have an alternative uh, program, but they, there's, there's a long way to go. We've got a long way to go in that direction. You have a question? Yeah. What do you want to say to the parent who has 19 or 20 years old? They've got a And you know, to convince him that the person needs them that. I mean, how can you convince a parent that's a 19 years old or 20 years old, where you have to call him, and is the right time now to get married? You know, let me tell you a story. The question was, how do you convince a parent of a 20 year old that their kid needs to get married early? Especially if you notice something and they don't notice it. So there was a story like that. Imam tells them, the mother, I think you need to get your daughter married early. She says, no. She's too, too young. She's just uh, you know, uh, 19. She needs to get married now. He says, okay. Let me show you something. Opens up Facebook. The daughter, Muslim family, daughter went to the prom. She was a prom queen. Parents had no idea. She was the worst dressed of even the non-Muslims. And there's hundreds of pictures of her on Facebook. The mother sees it and can't believe her eyes. She can't believe her eyes. Why? Because our parents are completely oblivious to reality. They have no idea what's going on in the kids' lives. They don't. They assume if my, my child doesn't tell me there's a problem, there is no problem. They assume if my kid says they're going to the library, they're at the library. Right? This is, this is a harsh reality check. It's a very harsh reality check. But until there's open communication between parents and kids, this conversation will never happen. If that 20 year old, 20 year old boy's mother or father actually talked to the 20 year old openly for an hour, not, hey, you want to get married? Oh no. Okay, I guess not. That's a one second conversation. An actual one hour conversation, they will learn things they never knew about their own child. The problem isn't anything else but communication within them. That communication has to open up. Everything else will become clear. What, there's a lot of things in your kids head you have no idea. Just talk to them. Just talk to them. And don't terrify them that if they are actually honest, you'll kill them. Let them speak their mind. You know? Yeah, because they're scared. You have to convince them there's nothing to be scared of first. And you have to do a lot of, undo a lot of damage. If they don't talk to you with this, they're still terrified. They think you're just going to not accept, it'll be completely unacceptable. In the end, you have to be, you have to go out of your way to get them to open up. Especially teenagers, it's very hard to get them to talk. It's harder than a root canal. You know, your kids don't talk to you. You say, how was your day? Yeah. What'd you do? I don't know. Where are you going? I don't know. Yeah. You know, that's all they do. Yeah. <laughs> and then they'll, they'll text their friend, my, my, my parents are asking me too many questions. Right? And they'll talk to their friend for like hours. Hours. They have so much to say, but not to their parents. That's true. Not to their parents. But that, this is a, it's, it's a common problem in our society. You have to work hard to, you have to keep nudging at it little by little by little until it breaks. And a lot of, I think that will help with that on the side is taking trips with your, with your youth without their cell phones. No texting. Take it away. It's not like their texts are all that awesome anyway. No, with eight O's, <laughs> or low with twelve L's, or what? <laughs> or sub, S U P P P P P. Where are you at? They're sitting next to them, where are you at? That's all they do. 
You know, it's making them socially stunted. They can't carry a normal conversation. You talk to a young person, they're talking to you for a second, and they're like, mm-hmm, yeah, mm-hmm. <laughs> Take the phone away for a while. Just, just talk to them. Expect them to be humans. It's going to be hard. <laughs> we'll expect them to be humans. I think I've been talking for too long. Trouble. Call it quits. Anybody?